everyone, it is Caitlin, and today we are making an 1850s jacket from a Bodie's Ladies Book pattern, and also features pockets. Alright, so this is Caitlin coming to you from the editing room, who just realized that apparently I forgot to press the record button when I was talking about the pattern and the fabric we were using. So the video kind of goes straight into cutting and sewing, which didn't really make a lot of sense. So, we're back in here kind of look at fabric. So the main fabric of this project, um, this lovely wool that is, um, I think it was described to me as a robin eggs blue. It's really more like a mint green. It's a little bit of a lighter shade than my table. It looks look kind of white on the camera, but it's definitely a green. And then for lining and trimming, I picked this silk, which was described to me as a mauve silk. It's actually a black shot with pink, so it has this really cool changeable iridescent effect, which is really cool. Anyway, so the pattern I used is from Godie's Ladies Book, and so this one struck my eye because of all the trim. It is very 1850s, it has everything, it has tassels, it has tucks, it has, um, it has velvet ribbon, and there is fringe, it has everything you could possibly want on a jacket. I toned it down slightly, I did not put in, I did not put in the tucks, um, which I planned on not doing that. And I decided not to do the tassels because I figured the tassels would look weird if I didn't have the tucks in them. So, it was kind of a slightly toned down version, but they're still fringe and they're still ribbon. So, it's still kind of, you know, fun. So, Godie's actually published a pattern for this piece. And so, what I did is I took that, blew it up to the right proportions and printed it out, um, taped the pieces together. This is just part of one, I think. I used the design, but then I used the pattern for another jacket. Still the same year, so it's still perfectly appropriate. It just wasn't what I was planning to, because the one I was going to use, um, the measurements didn't quite match up to what it what would make sense. Yeah, welcome to 19th century life. We don't give specific instructions. We just give you a general idea and assume you are intelligent enough to figure it out on your own. And the sleeves are double sleeves, and the pattern actually describes them as being an upper and a lower sleeve. So I ended up did having to make up kind of my own pattern with both of the sleeves. Uh, I think for the upper sleeve, I ended up using, was, I was able to salvage um, one of the pattern pieces from one of the diagrams from Godie's. The lower sleeve just wasn't working out, so yeah, I had to kind of fudge that. Turned out really well. Uh, if I did it again, I think I would make them a little narrower so that, you know, they actually retain some warmth because giant pagoda sleeves, there's a lot of air in everywhere. But, you know, I do have wool and under sleeves to kind of take care of that issue, so. But with all that being said, let's go ahead and get cutting and sewing. <laughs> pieces together. I am not sewing the lining with it yet. I'm going to do them as separate pieces since it's a jacket. And I've been able to look inside one or two original jackets and, um, well, two. And they were both lined like this. So that is what I am doing because that's the knowledge I have at this very moment. Let's sew together the pelerine as well. and tap some trimming. So um, I dyed some vintage trim and it nearly exactly matches the lining, which is kind of cool. I still have no idea how I managed that. But it was like the perfect dye bath. I had to mix two dyes together to get the color I wanted. And even with that, I still managed to exhaust the dye which almost never happens to me because I just put way too, I just don't really measure. But this time I decided to do so. It worked. And I got a really pretty color. I was really concerned about it actually because the original fringe wasn't white. It was like this cream color. Um, actually it's the same fringe we put on the 
red silk dress that we made. So it looked that they, they still like called it oatmeal. So I was really concerned about like how that would affect the color and all that, but it, it worked really well. So yeah, I'm gonna sew this on with two little running stitches, one on the top, one on the bottom. So what I'm gonna do, even though this is a jacket, I don't have a jacket coloring original to kind of go against this, but I do have an original coloring from the 1850s. So we're gonna do what that lady, we're gonna do what that seamstress did, which was essentially to bag line the coloring, um, which essentially means that you will don't see the raw edges on any, on any side of the coloring. So I'm going to stitch it um, right sides together down the so I'm going to stitch it right sides together down the center front, all the way around and back up the center front. I'm going to leave the neckline, and then we're going to put a little bit of, um, I'm going to use bias. She used straight green. I tried that with the last original I did that, and it was finicky. So we're going to use a bias today, which is still perfectly correct, to finish off the edge. We're not going to do piping. We're just going to make it a bias edge, um, just like the original I have did. stitched and then turned inside out. I have the neckline pinned together. We're going to put the bias on. You know, earlier I mentioned the original pelery that I um, own. And if you're interested more about that, I will attempt to link a, the video where I studied that piece in depth um, somewhere on the screen. I have never done that before, but I will attempt to learn. So hopefully it'll be on the screen somewhere. And um, I also made a pattern from that pelerine, so if you're interested in that, it'll be in a, the description of that video, but I'll also link it in the description of this video as well. Alright, this is going to get machine stitched on, and then we'll come back and stitch it on by hand on the other way. Let's move on to trimming. There's that, and I have, here's all my lovely fringe. I'm gonna find the end of this. I'm sure it's somewhere. And I'm just putting it on the edge. All the way around. Rob's going to put some velvet ribbon on, and I think I'm just going to like eyeball this. And this will get sewn on the same way as the fringe, which is just a running stitch on either end, which is what it shows in my originals. We're also going to put fringe on the sleeve, so here are the pagoda, the long sleeves essentially. Um, which I just did wool up to here and then I did silk so it's not totally bulky up in the arm side. And then here are the other sleeves. So on the original drawing, these sleeves are simply just have the velvet ribbon on them. And the other ones have fringe and velvet ribbon. I'm running out of pins. I'm thinking about just doing two rows of fringe on the bottom. The original I think shows three, but shows one right on top of the fringe, and we don't need one right on top of the fringe because the fringe is just, the fringe has a pretty design on it anyway. I guess if you're doing like making your own fringe, you would want something to kind of cover up that edge, sort of like what we did with um, the blue checked gown a couple months ago. Alright, welt pockets. So it's the very first welt pocket I've ever put in my life. 
and it works. Um, it's not perfect, but it works. So, nice pretty little large pocket. It's a nice large pocket on the back. And now we get to try to repeat the same thing on this side. It should be very interesting. Okay. I do know I tried it on and I decided about eight inches from the top is where I wanted the pocket. And I want it set at the same angle the darts are set at. And I want this little spot here to be two inches from the last start. So I'm going to stitch on the machine just along this line and we'll be back. Alright, here are my stitches. I'm going to cut through all three layers here. Right in the middle, or as close to the middle as I can. Making sure I have to cut through the layers that I need to cut out, not the rest of them. Okay. I'm going to need to turn all this inside out and iron it very, very well if I can get it to look right. before flipping this part up and folding it here. And we won't do any stitching yet, but I'm just gonna fold it like that. So now here's what our pocket looks like from the right side. I can still like put my fingers through there and that sort of thing. We're gonna take the uh, flat bit and stick it up in here. Now I'm gonna stitch just basically from here, right along the edge and kind of down here, making sure I don't hit this part. Uh, otherwise my pocket won't open. Here's our lovely little pocket. And um, I didn't catch any of it. So, yeah. We're gonna go right ahead and sew. Um, actually first we're going to trim this off. And I'm going to take my pocket. This one I had to piece a little bit. I didn't realize until after I cut them all that um, little square missing. So I just kind of pieced it slightly together. I'm going to stitch this just on the little flap here. And while I'm over there, I'm going to take the second pocket and put it up here. I'm going to stitch it right on right above that last stitching line. I don't want it um, to really be I don't want to be on the stitching line or below it, I just want it to right above that stitching line. And with that stitched, I'm going to just take it from across here, stitch all the way around the pocket, um, at which point we're going to just trim off all the pieces that are just in excess. So mo a lot of this is going to get trimmed off, all this on the bottom of this one is going to get trimmed off. So now I'm going to take the lining and stitch it to the fashion fabric. I have the fashion fabric and lining right sides together. I'm going to stitch down the center front. I'm going to leave the hem and the neckline open for right now. Um, we're going to finish off the neckline with piping. And the hemline we're going to fold up slightly and hide the raw edge in the fringe. With the neck piping in, I am trying to put in sleeves. So I got one in with both the upper and lower bits. So now we are trying to put in the second one. So I'm going to stitch the sleeve in and I'm also going to hand just whip the piping back on and then we get to put on trim. Now I'm at the point where I'm putting the trim on the bottom hem of the jacket. So there's our pocket here. And I'm doing the exact same thing for, you know, even the fringe trim. I'm just doing a running stitch on top and then a running stitch on the bottom. And I hemmed it. I forget the front to show this. I basically just folded the hem up. And I'm going to hide it in this and it'll just be stitched down. So, that is how that is getting finished. I guess after I get this trimmed, we'll be putting hooks and eyes on the jacket. 
and I'm going to do fancy buttons on the coloring. After putting in hooks and eyes on the actual jacket bodice, last I was putting in buttons on the coloring. So I just took wooden forms and covered them with the silk that we've been lining things with. Um, thought about doing something like kind of decorative on front, I might do that eventually. I haven't quite decided. I don't want to do dorset buttons, mostly because I like when doing the uh, black silk dress. I'm really not a fan of dorset buttons. And I um, wasn't really sure about the red covered either. Um, I, don't think, I think that would look better eventually, I think. But yeah. Anyway, so we're just doing this, and then I have some um, silk cording that I've put together to make the little loopy things. Let's find the other side of this. And so this side has the buttons, just buttons, and this side has buttons and loops. And it does kind of fit over. I think it goes this way, actually. And these just connect. So it's really not a very secure closure. Um, this type of closure is not secure at all, uh, but it's just the coloring. So, like, even if I was doing this on a bodice or a jacket itself, I would put hooks and eyes underneath to actually be the closure, and this would kind of be more decorative. But because this is just a coloring, it really doesn't need to be, this will work just fine. So, we're going to put in the last one. And uh, y'all haven't seen this yet, but I actually bought a couple of new original pieces. Um, this one, in particular, is interesting. Just in the fact that when looking at it, I can kind of clearly see it was a earlier 1860s dress, and then someone updated it to be more, you know, mid to later 1860s, um, just with a little pelerine piece here that kind of comes down. There's the finished edge of her bodice, and she just took uh, some extra fabric she had. She even had to piece it in several places because she didn't have quite the amount of fabric that she needed. And she just tacked on a pelerine. On, just on the finished edge. There's the finished edge of her bodice. And she was like, you know what? We're not even going to take this apart and redo it. We're just going to add something to the bottom of it, which is kind of awesome. And then she has this very um, I don't know, straight lined trim work, I suppose. Um, but there are spaces where you can see, I think it was on this side actually, yeah, where it was a much gentler curve to the trim at one point in time, which is more earlier. So yeah, this is just an updated dress, and I brought it out actually just to see her buttons. <laughs> We're not actually studying this piece today, eventually we will. But she has these lovely uh, velvet covered buttons, and because I did silk fabric on the pelerine, I wanted to see how she attached them, and instead of finding like, and instead of making like a shank on the bottom where she would just loop it through like you would a normal button, she took the sides and just kind of did whip stitches all the way around the button. So that's what we're going to do on our pelerine. But yeah, uh, eventually I'd like to do an actual study of this piece. And my idea, instead of like recreating this one exactly, because I don't do a whole lot of mid to late 1860 stuff, I thought about taking it down to its, well, not this piece, but doing this dress, but how it would have been, been before she updated it, which I think would be a really interesting study on how garments were updated and changed with the fashions, and also kind of going into those what was original and what was updated bits of the construction. So eventually we're going to do that. I don't actually have it in the works anytime soon, but eventually that's what I would like to do. And I think that would be a really cool little study. Yeah, you can clearly see the different lining fabrics. Yeah, anyway. It's a really cool little piece, and yeah, I look forward to getting that, to that eventually. It's just going to be a while. But yeah, I thought I wanted to share that, mostly just because of the buttons here. I'll move her out of the way. And so that's what I, so I've been kind of doing the same thing with my pelerine. Putting the buttons down and just doing little stitches all the way around. It's just we have to attach this piece as well on the side. And I've been starting by just going through once and putting it down, pulling my pins out, and then kind of putting it back up in the center, going all the way through to the back of the button, pulling this very tight, and then taking this piece, and this is really hard to 
um, stitch on or these types of things. So I've been going one stitch and I've been using um, silk thread to sew all these on too because that's the closest thread that I have that's the color that would match this. So I don't want it to be totally invisible. So I'm just trying to hide the little join underneath the button and I'm kind of going over catching the coloring fabric and catching the button. Pulling that down. It's a little finicky. And it might help if my buttons weren't quite so round. And for a couple of them I went around the button a couple several times um, instead of just once. But it kind of just depends on the button and how um, wiggly it wants to be after you've stitched it in. Alright, well that concludes the sewing for this project. So I'm going to go put on an 1850s dress and we'll try on the jacket. Um, but it's by itself first so you can see that and then we'll put on the pelerine as well. Alright, so I'm dressed. Um, chose the lilac chantilly skirt and then just the wool bath. I figured we're doing winter stuff so um, wool bath probably a good idea as opposed to the actual bodice. Um, I have the undersleeves and I also have these lovely woolen knit undersleeves I did from, I think an 1856 pattern um, somewhere in there. Slightly modified but they're really warm. And so yeah I don't know if they're supposed to be instead of these undersleeves or if it's like in addition to but I can use them in addition to. Um, just kind of slip under and I can pull them off and still have my regular undersleeves, like if I go indoors or something. That what, that's what makes sense to me. So yeah, I guess I can go ahead and try on the jacket. Getting it on over pagoda sleeves could be interesting. Definitely glad we did this silk lining. I was concerned about putting the bodice pagoda sleeves inside the armholes because they're so big, but the, they slide right on the silk, so it's not an issue, which is a good thing. So I'm definitely happy about that. I still have to kind of pull them down a little bit. But that was not nearly as difficult as I expected it to be. Good thing we lined these, this in silk. Glad that it's not super, super fitted. I was hoping that that's how that would work. Because I want something to like match my figure, but I don't want it to be super tight over the bodice. And this is a pretty thick bodice because it's a wool. There we go. That is really cute. I love that. That is absolutely adorable. I wasn't so sure about the color because it's, you know, very light and not exactly what I would pick for myself. Um, just have to know it was on sale. But I think that's really cute and I love the the fringe on it. It's really, really nice. Yeah, I'm really happy with that. Let's put on the coloring. Yeah, that is very appropriately 1850s. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad I finally have 1850s outerwear <laughs> because lately, because what I've done in the past is just to wear this particular basque with a skirt and these undersleeves. That was the extent of my outerwear for the 1850s. So this is definitely a, a good thing to add to my wardrobe. Not that I do a lot of winter stuff, however, um, between docenting that's like very consistent year round and then uh, Texas Living History Association usually has their conference in January. So I do attend cold weather events. Technically I dressed out in cold weather, let's put it that way. I've kind of avoided doing 1850s because I didn't have outerwear particularly for that time period. So now I don't have that excuse, I can actually do 1850s in winter time. So awesome. Good thing. To go out of course I'd have to wear my bonnet. See if I put my hair where it should be. And yeah, more or less. I keep putting my hair slightly too low for this bonnet. So again, I'm used to doing 1860s, so that's probably where that's coming from. Okay. And then I have some gloves. I actually stole these from the uh, 1830 glove container that we did. But yeah, I think this is really cute. It's very warm. Um, it's getting a little warm in here. But anyway, I'm also in the house, so if I went outside right now, because it is cold outside right now, um, for Texas anyway. So I think if I went outside right now, I'd be very comfortable in this. So yeah, it definitely is what I needed it to be, which is outerwear for the 1850s. So, well, I hope you enjoyed our little 1850s outerwear adventure, and I will see you in the next video.